911, what's your emergency? Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the PIO Podcast, a place to discuss all public information related topics for police, fire, EMS, and local and federal government organizations. It was a good learning experience for a lot of us that, that social media is not real life. But we have to remember the media are very rarely a target audience. They're simply that conduit. Our words have impacts on individuals and it may not be positive. So just be just being thoughtful and mindful of the words that we speak. I think what's so interesting about this position too and this job and this profession is that um, every one of us is looking for purpose. And when we find it here, that's it. To know is that a crisis for one is not necessarily a crisis for another. This episode is sponsored by the Social Media Strategy Summit, the leading provider of social media education. They host annual events designed specifically for government communications professionals like you to help you build and engage your communities through social media. Visit their website at socialmediastrategiesummit.com to learn more and use promo code PIO podcast for 10% off of your registration. to the PIO podcast today on the show we have commander Matthew Kroll from the U.S. Coast Guard he is the head communications officer for the Coast Guard welcome to the show great thanks for having me sir you have uh you you have a pretty well distinguished career so I'd like to I'd like to talk about the responsibilities that you have as a media relations person for the U.S. Coast Guard and could you break down how communications goes at the district level. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the the district level, so first of all, the Coast Guard has nine districts that are pretty much geographic areas that we split apart. So each each district is normally either one state or a handful of states. So like Alaska is its own district, but um, our, our D, what we call District 8 is pretty much the entire like middle of the United States, all the inland rivers are. So they have probably 20 states or so. So um, I was the District 11 uh, public affairs officer for, for a few years, and that was California, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. Um, the district is pretty much like the entry-level job for public affairs officers at a full-time level. So um, lieutenant, lieutenant commander, so the 03, 04 ranks, if you're familiar with officer ranks in, in the military, um, that's pretty much where you stand uh, at, at the district level. So Um, you're responsible for everything within your geographic area. So in California, that kept me quite busy between San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, Lake Tahoe, and uh, even the the northern coast, the the Humboldt Humboldt, uh, area, uh, way to the north. Um, And so that is kind of like the, you're you're really the, the, you service everyone around there. So you have about, um, we had about, uh, I'd say 5,000 Coast Guard members in the state of California. Um, and they're broken down. So in the, the Coast Guard is really broken down into about dozens, if not hundreds, of smaller units. So a 100, 100 person a unit is considered a large unit in the Coast Guard. So um, we had, you know, anytime something would happen with any of those units and they needed media or public affairs help, they would reach out to my office. And so uh, if you wanted a press release that was handled at my office, we managed the social media accounts for all of the units. So they would manage them but we would oversee them as the administrator and make sure that they were in compliance and just give them the training mm-hmm. as people rotated in and out. So um, it kept me quite busy, uh, to be honest. It was probably the the busiest career I've ever had in the Coast Guard. I've been in 19 years now, and those uh, four years as the D11 public affairs officer just, I mean, I'm still recovering from them. <laughs> <laughs> but a uh, lot, of, lot of fun. They really were. So let me ask you this. Did you start out your career, at, did you want to be public affairs? Um, I, I actually did, um, but that's not really how the Coast Guard works. So right. I, I had a bachelor's in communications, and I actually enlisted uh, first, and I wanted to be a public affairs specialist, which is our enlisted rating. Um, very small rating. There's only about 70 of the PA specialists, I mean, PAs really at, at any one time. 
Um, and the, the wait is usually about two to three years. So when it gets to be more than about two to three years, they pretty much shut the list down. They don't let anyone else join. So I just happened to join at the time where the list was completely shut down. Um, and so I couldn't go public affairs. And so at the same time, I was applying for officer candidate school um, in hopes to be a public affairs officer someday. Um, but in the meantime, the opportunity to be a pilot and go to flight school came across my desk and I just could not turn that down. Um, so I spent the first about 10 years of my career as uh, an aviation, either an, an electrical technician and then eventually a pilot and instructor pilot for uh, helicopters. Oh, so you have definitely seen some duty. Yeah, yes. Yes, I, um, I did about four years in San Francisco at Air Station San Francisco, and then three years at Air Station Atlantic City in New Jersey. So got to see uh, both coasts from the air uh, with a few deployments to Hawaii um, and then um, D.C. We did a lot of D.C. flying as well, so uh, seen, seen quite a bit. It's been a lot of fun. I'm sure it has. Just, uh, you know, my son is in the Coast Guard, and he is stationed up at uh, um, uh, Naval Station Everett in uh in everett washington and i was just up there last week to see him got to look at the at his boat and uh and then right across the way there's four navy destroyers i mean just incredible stuff and the things that he's told me he's done so far are just incredible and you know he just every time he talks he's just so enthusiastic so the core the coast guard is really near and dear to our family now and and i'm I'm extremely proud of him for for wanting to be involved in, in such a noble, um, a very noble organization like the Coast Guard and the oldest military organization in the country, correct? Uh, continuous. continuous. We like to say the word continuous. So technically the Navy was formed before us, but there was a period that the Navy disbanded for a few years. Um, but they still count those years as their birthday, you know, as their, <laughs> as their age. So we won't, you know, we won't hold it against them, but we like to say we're the oldest, con- oldest continuous seagoing service uh, in the United States. Excellent. All right. So the roles and the duties of the Coast Guard, they're one of the broadest missions of any of the uh, military branches out there. Can you talk about what make what which complicates it, what, what the difficulties are dealing with such a broad mission? Uh, yes, that's that's pretty much the the frustration um, every, every time when you're trying to just kind of establish like a brand for the Coast Guard, because if you go to different areas of the country, the, the Coast Guard means different things to different people. So in, in the Northwest, uh, where your son is, we do a lot more of like the fisheries patrols and a lot more of the search and rescue. Um, and it's kind of the same thing in the Northeast. There's a lot of fisheries up there in, in like, you know, the Boston, New York area, New England. Um, in in the south, like southeast, we do a lot more immigration. I mean, there's a lot more of at sea interdiction of both drugs and and uh, people trying to get into the United States, um, you know, uh, un- illegally there. So we do a lot more of that law enforcement type mission down to the south. Um, in California, we did a lot of search and rescue, uh, but we also did a lot of environmental response in California because um, we've had you know there's a lot of oil refineries, a lot of shipping ports. So one little accident, one little spill in the state of California, um, and, and we really had to just jump on it with environmental response because that area is just so sensitive out there, uh, both politically and environmentally, that you know you really just had to stay on top of it. So um, kind of trying to fit that into a you know one single sentence. I mean, you know, you look at the other branches and the other services, and you can kind of describe them in one sentence. If you say, "What's a marine?" You know, "What's a sailor?" "What's an airman?" You can. Right. You can, for the most part, picture that person in your head. But if you said, what's a Coast Guard you know, person? What's a Coast Guard member look like? That you're going to get about 15 different you know, ideas in people's heads, depending where you go and what their experiences are. Um, and so it's hard to kind of play into that, that uh, expectation as, as you go along and as you're trying to message your key audiences and as you're trying to build credibility around the country. So would it be, would it be fair to say that maybe the brand of the Coast Guard, depending on if you're in the Northeast and the, and the Northwest, it's it's different completely than what's going on in the southeast and the southwest. A- absolutely different, absolutely different, and that's that's really where I depend. So I'm at the headquarters level where I deal, you know, nationally and internationally. Um, I really depend a lot on my field units and my district PAOs to kind of manage their messaging, and then I'll just kind of come in as like a you know like a tweak a tweak of oh yeah use this word instead of that word. Otherwise, it's good to go. Um, but I, I'm relying on their intimate knowledge of the local environment down there 
Um, I wouldn't write the same talking point for a, a sector commander in Miami as I would for one in Puget Sound. I mean, that's just, it's just not going to land the same way. Um, but all of those come through my office. So whether it's the same mission that, you know, say it could be the same search and rescue type mission in Puget Sound as it is in Miami, and the same things happen, the same facts of the case are the same, but we have to just kind of phrase it just a little bit differently because those audiences and those expectations of who we are, they just vary geographically like that. You know, I just had a thought. What was it like in the, in the for you guys in the military during the pandemic? I just, can you, can you cover a little I mean, bit of that? How much time do we have? <laughs> as much no, as you want. It, it um, it was it was very interesting and it was very challenging. I think um, one of the things that makes the Coast Guard different than the other services is that we are a lot more isolated. So if you go to an Air Force base or an Army base, it's usually you know gigantic. It's usually like its own community. They have their own schools, their own post office, um, you know, their own shopping centers, all that kind of stuff. The Coast Guard base really is in the middle of the community. So whatever the community feels, that's what we felt, and so. Um, we still had to man those 24-hour watches of doing search and rescue. We still had to man the radios and the communication center. Um, so it was a lot like, you know, like the police departments and fire departments really couldn't just turn off the switch and say, hey, we're all teleworking today. <laughs> um, we, we were kind of in that same boat. You know, we, we really, I mean, pun intended, I guess. Um, but, but we still had to show up to work to someone had to be there. I mean, there, there was a few offices, like public affairs, I could do quite a bit remotely. Um, you know, just via email or via phone. Um, but I mean, if you remember, one of the first events that happened in the pandemic was the the, the cruise ship Grand Princess arriving into the port of Oakland. Yeah. I mean, I was on the pier. I was on the pier watching it come in um, with my partners in the state of California and Alameda and San Francisco counties, um, just working that event because we we couldn't do that from our our living room, even though there was already a shelter in place and they had already kind of cleared the area. Um, we had to be there, and so finding those those ways to get around those challenges was, uh, was, was pretty tough. Um, but you know, we kind of, we learned a lot. I think just like everyone, we learned a lot about what we can do remotely, uh, and, and what, what our priorities are in person. Um, and I, and I think we've, we've come out of much stronger unit, uh, you know, much stronger service in the end, you know? Well, that's good to hear. I'm glad to hear that. So the Coast Guard motto, which is Semper Paratus, always ready. Um, it kind of fits in well for a, a public affairs officer or a PIO, don't you think? Uh, it, it absolutely does. I think that's one of the first things I learned when I made the jump from aviation to public affairs was um, in aviation, I, I really only had, I mean, I, I would do multiple missions in the helicopter. Um, my bread and butter was search and rescue. So that was probably my strongest mission set, like skill set of being a subject matter expert when it came to search and rescue. We did a little bit of fisheries. We did a little, you know, security of the ports from the air. Um, but when I got to public affairs, I mean, within the first couple of months, I was exposed to more missions that I had only read about in our handbook. Um, and now I had to be kind of the expert on it because in the same day, I could deal with a port being shut down from either a cyber attack or a bomb scare. And so I had to worry about what our rules and regulations were for port, portways management. Um, I, I may have a, uh, you know, a, an illegal migrant fishing vessel that overturned off the coast of San Diego. And now we have 15, 20 people without life jackets um, in the water, you know, three, four miles offshore. Um, I, I could have had a, a drug interdiction of about a thousand kilograms of cocaine off the coast of, of Mexico and, and Central America. Um, and, and that's just operationally. I mean, I could also still deal with the same thing that we all deal with, which is, you know, unfortunately people, you know, behaving badly and, and getting arrested for, what, I had one commander who used to call it stupid human tricks. Every time we left for the weekend, he said, no stupid human tricks this weekend. But, but you know, those, those happen, right? right? So you still had to deal with just, uh, I mean, it was always, I hate to be cliche that every day was different. I mean, you never knew what you were going to get, but, you know, that really was it. And so you kind of had to adapt very quickly and just be ready to handle any mission uh, in any area. And uh, it, it was very challenging, but I think I think uh, you know it really kind of made me the officer I am today, getting that exposure as a public affairs. Officer. So, would you say pretty much every day the role is crisis communications, almost all the time? There's definitely a crisis communication element to almost everything we do because uh, I, you know, I, I always like to tell my my district commanders and my sector commanders if if you're if you don't think you're in crisis communications, you're preparing for it whether you know it or not. So, the the second a crisis happens or an incident occurs. Your credibility is what it is, and if you didn't get ready for your crisis, it's it's too late at that point. So you're either 
in a crisis, recovering from a crisis, or preparing for one. There is no non-crisis. Um, so even when we didn't have something going on, we were always trying to build that credibility, trying to match those expectations of what we would do if there was an incident. Okay. So because the mission for the Coast Guard is so broad, how does your messaging differ for internal versus external communication? Oof. In, internal has always been a challenge uh, for the Coast Guard. Number one, just because we're so split up geographically, as I mentioned mm-hmm. before, the you know the hundred person units you know divide about forty one thousand Coast Guard members by a hundred, and that's about how many bases we have roughly. Um, and so, just geographically, trying to hit all of those units and all of the people who are on twenty four hour cycles of on and off duty, so you never really have the entire Coast Guard in one place right. at one time. Um, so, trying to hit you know, the, the rotating watches as you go along was always difficult. Uh, but at the same time, we're fractured between what we call communities. So the aviation community was the part that I was in. And so we would get messages from our aviation counterparts of here's what's going on with either policy or, um, or just word from the Coast Guard. We had our, our cuttermen, which we call, we call our ships cutters. Anything over 65 feet is a cutter. Um, so that could be, you know, an 87 foot patrol boat that just goes out for a week or so, or it could be the, you know, 400 plus cutters that go overseas and, and you know, around the, mm-hmm. the country. Um, so that's our float community. We had our response committee, which is all of our small boats that are like our, you know, 45, 25 foot response boats that just get launched in five minutes and they're out of there. Um, to our prevention community, which is which is the the community that does all the inspections at ports and commercial vessels and make sure that everything's up to code. Um, and so, as you can kind of see already that, I mean, I just, that's like four or five communities off the top right. of my head. Um, and it's, it's even worse when you actually start to break down those communities within the communities, because in air, in a, just aviation, for an example, we have four main aircraft. Um, and so even in, on the helicopter side, we have our, our dolphin fleet and our Jayhawk fleet. And so you had to kind of split those up. Um, and everybody kind of silos a little bit. That's kind of our natural tendency to silo and be in our, our own little world. Um, and right. so we have to find ways to to kind of reach those those kind of those key individuals that can reach, um, you know, the, the the actual personnel. So we have um, what we call my my CG. You know, my Coast Guard is our is our online like news magazine for Coast Guard information. It's public facing, but all of the audience uh, is designed for, or all the content is designed for an internal audience. So anytime there's a policy change or a new program or new opportunity for Coast Guard members, that's that's where we where we uh, direct our members to go to get, you know, these stories and to get this information. Okay. I sounds incredibly daunting to have to deal with (laughs) that many different, uh, man, just the, the fingers that are going out in different directions of how you have to communicate or what you communicate is, is really, I, I, the only word I can think of is daunting. How many, (laughs) how many people work out of your, out of your office in DC? Uh, in, in DC, so we, we're going to split it down a little bit. So we have our, um, our public affairs and our government affairs and our community affairs are all in the same shop. Um, we have a, a one-star admiral that oversees kind of all three offices, um, in, in public affairs specifically, um, I might have my specific team is five people in the media relations desk. And then, um, probably overall in public affairs, I'd say 22 to 23 at the headquarters level. And then each district will vary anywhere between five and eleven people, depending on the number of offices they have. Okay, so a, a lot of lot of hands and a lot of a lot of eyes on stuff, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're catching everything or addressing everything either. No, no. I mean, just like any any communication shop. I mean, I, if if I could wave a magic wand and have you know fifteen twenty more people oh, yeah. in the office, uh, you know, life would be life would be grand, and I'd probably still be asking for fifteen to twenty more. <laughs> So, you know, it, like everyone, we try to make the best with what we have. And that's kind of the Coast Guard as well as we're, we're by far the smallest branch. Um, and, and so we always do less with more is kind of like our, our unofficial motto. All right. Or, sorry, do, do more with less. Like I already got that one backwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it. All right. So prior to my son being in the Coast Guard, I didn't understand how broad the mission was for the Coast Guard. And, and, and part of that is part of that your community's communication strategy to let the public know what you guys do in the Coast Guard? Because I think of the general public, it's either drug interdiction or rescues, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, you got to play the hits, you know? That's that's kind of the hard part is, uh, you know, as, as much as we don't need people to recognize that we do search and rescue and law enforcement, you know, that's 
that's really what gets me past the gatekeepers, if you will, is okay. those, those exciting videos. You know that um, the hard part is that what what makes us the most relevant in in terms of um, you know to the American public isn't really the most exciting visually. Mm-hmm. So our our management of the you know maritime commerce industry, waterways, ports. Um, and, and just give you an idea, when, when a hurricane comes, we have to shut down a port. I did Hurricane uh, Lane out in Hawaii, where we had to shut down the port of Honolulu for like three days as we were waiting for the, the eye of the storm to come by and, and pass us so we could reopen it. Um, that's the only port that's in Hawaii. So if anything were to happen to that port, they pretty much said the, the, the islands of Hawaii only have about four to five days worth of of um, supplies oh, wow. to you know to keep everything stocked. So if we kept that down, if we had to close that port, we would have had to start flying in, you know, by C one thirty or C five, everything that that island would need to survive. And so it, it really gave us an opportunity to kind of highlight the importance of the port. You know, the port is kind of the lifeline. You know, ninety percent of our imports and exports in the in, in the nation's economy go through our shipping ports. So if you imagine when when we had uh, the pandemic, that's really what we saw a lot. We saw a lot of the backlog. I mean, the, the ports just could not handle all of the routes coming in. We couldn't get ships coming in for, um, you know, for, for months. And, and we saw it. We've, we've kind of felt the squeeze of that. Um, and so that's, that's kind of, that's kind of the, the really important part about the Coast Guard. It's just not, it's not the exciting part. So it doesn't, you know, right. it's not going to be on a billboard somewhere that, you know, we, we kept the port open, you know, that's, that's not terribly exciting. Um, but it is. That's when, when you start to get in the meat and potatoes of, of what the Coast Guard brings to the country, um, you really can't not talk about maritime commerce because that just, you know, it, it's it's really if you if you were to look at what each port feeds in terms of you know the port let's say is in L.A. but then you look at if you were to put a, G, a GPS tracker in every truck that left the port of L.A. and said where did it go? I mean, it would look like a, a fractured spider web across the entire western part of the United States. So things that come into the port of LA feed almost anything, you know, west of the Mississippi at that point. So pretty, pretty important. But again, uh, it, that's the hard part is messaging. It's that, not you know? the I, sexy stuff. That's the, that's yeah. the problem, right? Yeah. And, and it's hard to fit that in like a 15, 20 second soundbite as well. So you really need one of those sit down interviews with like a print magazine to really talk about something like this, this in depth and this complex. Okay. Um, you call you co-authored a book about media relations in the military. Can you can you tell you to talk about some of the key takeaways in that? Yes, yes. So this is it was a joint book. Um, we had six authors um, from pretty much all of the branches of the service, and uh, so I was the lowly um, the lone Coast Guard PAO for this one. Um, almost everybody was is 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 pretty senior in rank and is either. Uh, retired and moved on to um, academia, so they now are teaching at the college level, um, or they they taught at our Defense Information School, which is the Public Information Public Affairs School for the the military, um, right up up the road from me in in Fort Meade, Maryland. Um, and and really, the design is that we we were looking and saying, you know, there's really is a gap between what military public affairs is. Uh, there's you know there's a lot of of academic studies on you know civilian public relations. Um, we're starting to see a lot more on public information, but public public affairs for the for the military is just slightly different, and it's it's quite regulated. I mean, we really have a lot of restrictions on what we can and can't do with government funding, um, and we have a different role because, I mean, really, if you look at national defense, um, right. you know, no one really thinks about military communications unless we're at a time of war, and then you start thinking of, you know, the the Committee on Public Information uh, from World War One, and you start thinking of you know Vietnam embeds and and the and the you know the restrictions on on letting people go letting journalists go into war zones, um, but there's still military public affairs going on 24 hours a day, you know 365 days a year, and and a lot of people just don't understand it. You know they a lot of us a lot of the the military commanders would look at us kind of this probably the same way that that police PIOs are looked at, where it's like break break glass in case of emergency. Hey, PAO, come bail me out. I got into trouble. I need you to message me out of this kind of thing. And, and so really the book was designed to be kind of an overview of what public affairs from a military level can do for a commander, but also to kind of be um, an explanation to a public relations college student. So if you're, let's say you're majoring in mass comm or public relations journalism, 
um, and you wanted to learn a little bit about government communications, that's what this book is designed to do. It, it has a small, you know, short overview at the beginning, but it's designed to kind of take someone who has at least a, a basic knowledge of government communications or public affairs and give them a little more tools of like, you know, it's, I think it's like 135 pages. So it's designed to be a quick read, um, but it's designed for that kind of second level of, um, I, I know what public relations is. I want to see if maybe public affairs is what I get into, or now I'm a military or government, you know, leader. How can I use public affairs to help myself, you know, achieve my operational objectives? So okay. All right. it was, it was a lot of fun. Good. I'm glad to see, I'm glad to hear that. I'll put a link in the uh, show notes to the book. So in case anybody wants to, to go ahead and purchase it or whatever, this way they can see what you put in there. Great. Um, great. Is there a question I should have asked? And if so, what would uh, the answer be? Um, well, I would hope the question everybody's asking is how can I join the Coast Guard right now? I mean, that's that's kind of, uh, you know, um, I think, I think um, joking aside, um, the, the question is that I mostly have to answer is, you know, who is the Coast Guard? What does the Coast Guard do? And, and as we just kind of said, it, it really depends. And so I think um, the, the question that, that I would say is, um, you know, what, what's, in, what's in the future for the Coast Guard, right? Like, where are we going from here? If, if you look at our history, the Coast Guard is actually made up of five different agencies that all came together to kind of form one agency. So, you know, the, the Lighthouse Service, there used to be a government agency that was in charge of lighthouses. So um, we, we kind of took that over uh, in 1939. And then uh, the Bureau of Navigation, that's our waterways mission, the Life, Life Saving Service um, in, two, in 1915. So that, that is kind of our small boat station. And then the revenue cutter service is kind of, that's kind of what we consider our, you know, our, our, our grandfather uh, service that, that we, you know, that's our heritage is, is that service. So, um, you know, what's next? You know, we've changed from the Department of Transportation, uh, sorry, the Department of Treasury first because we were enforcing tariffs. And then in 1967, we moved to the Department of Transportation and our focus was boating safety. Um, Department of Homeland Security in 2003, and we really became a lot more of a law enforcement agency after that. Um, what's what's next? I'd, I'd like to say um, cyber is really the future for almost all the military branches. I mean, there, there's always been that saying that you know World War III is going to be is going to be fought without guns, and um, and we've seen just a few cyber attacks, like the Port of Los Angeles had one when I was in LA or when I was in California. Um, and it was very eye-opening for us to, just, just to kind of see these fully automated ports, what would happen if they, you know, if they shut down, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and that's what we kind of saw. So fortunately for us, that was a minimal impact, and it really just kind of opened our eyes. And ever since then, we've been running full steam on getting cyber up and running. And so um, I, that's what I'm brushing up on right now as a, as a media relations specialist is uh, we're going to be doing working a lot more with Cybercom, U.S. Cybercom. We have our own uh, Coast Guard Cyber Command now, um, and we just created a new enlisted rating for cyber mission, cyber mission specialists. So um, that's kind of the future for us. So if you're not reading about what cyber is uh, in your industry and how it's going to affect your organization, I, I mean, that's my warning for everybody is it's going to get you. It's going to catch up with you eventually. So that's where we're going right now is, is the cyber realm. Yeah, I, I think a lot of municipality, a lot of in the in the public sector for law enforcement, that's probably the least thought about process or organization within their organization to begin with. So uh, I'll give you a great example. Our IT department where I work, they don't talk to people very well. They don't play with people very well. And when it all goes bad, we're not going to know what to do. I, I mean, they, yeah. I know they yeah. certainly will not. So it's going to, it'll be quite interesting. And uh, I'm sure several, you know, some smaller Law enforcement agencies have had cyber attacks where they've had denial of services or they've had the ransomware put on and they've had, you know, they've made a decision to either pay the ransomware or not be able to access their systems anymore. So, mm -hmm. you know, that I know ransomware is a big thing and it's so easy to, it can be so heck quickly occurring now with all the phishing attacks that everybody sees. So, yeah, you know, yeah. Well, we could put it in, in a perspective of like the practitioner, right? So if your organization had a cyber attack and you completely lost your computer system for, let's just say, eight hours, what would the public expect that you can still do and that you couldn't still do? And if you don't know the answer to that, 
then you're going to have to message and explain why your your you know your stakeholders don't know that answer either. Yeah. And so trying to get out like that you're doing these cyber attack exercises or cyber attack simulations or just letting people know that you're taking steps. I mean, that's going to pay off dividends because I just I just imagine that we're going to see more and more of these cyber attacks and they might be little small guys like you're talking about the phishing <laughs> that you know just maybe shut down payroll for a, a you know a day or so or they just you know end up just being like a leak for everybody. Um, but how do you explain that? How are you going to explain that to the public? And how are you going to explain what you're doing about it? If you don't have that in your back pocket, um, it's going to be really tough to find when all your computers are down. So um, that's kind of like the, that's what keeps me up at night is, is really just thinking about if, if a cyber attack were to happen on the Coast Guard, what would I be able to say about it very quickly? Um, and what, what, what would the public expect us to be doing? Because I don't know if I've set those expectations yet um, or if we have as a service. So. Uh, something to think about as you move forward. All right. Did you hear that, fellow PIOs? That's something to think about for your own agencies. Absolutely. I agree. All right. So let's jump into some rapid fire questions. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Texting or talking? Uh, talking. Talking. I wouldn't be in this industry if I didn't like to talk. So coffee. Talking all day. Coffee or tea? Uh, I think I'm. That's my blood type is coffee. So uh, definitely coffee. I've. I've tried to do tea when I, you know, trying to relax in the evening and sleep better. I just, I, I kind of have the, the, the Ted Lasso, uh, you know, uh, reaction to tea. It's just, I, I can't make it work. Yep. Have you seen the new series? Uh, are you ready for the new series coming out? Oh, I've been, I've been waiting. <laughs> I, we've been waiting. We, we just started, like, we, we kind of have like a calendar of our uh, next seasons coming out uh, each for each, each series that we watch. Outstanding. So I can't wait. Adult drink of choice. Ooh, you know, I used to have a brand of being like uh, the IPA guy. So no matter where you went, someone would ask me, you know, what's what's the good IPA to get if I'm visiting this area from a local brewery? But um, as I get older, and really during the pandemic, I've kind of reached out to uh, to bourbon. Bourbon's kind of been my drink of choice. So bourbon on the rocks with just a splash of uh, of, of simple syrup, and uh, and I'm good to go. So easy. I, I like bourbon. What would be your superpower if you could have one? Well, I always thought that um, from my flying days that I, you know, would always just pick that I'd like to fly. But I think that's almost, you know, been there, done that kind of a thing now. And um, I've always been a history buff. So I think I think time travel uh, is just too tempting uh, to not have if, if someone were to give me a blank, a blank check for that one. Oh, interesting. Do you have a pet? No, no, we move every couple of years. Um, you know, I've lived in probably nine states in the last, you know, 19 years. So uh, pets kind of complicate that. Had a fish tank for a while when I was living in San Diego. It didn't survive the first move, so we got rid of it. Um, so looking looking forward to potentially having a pet when I can settle down. Cool. Is there a book or author that had an influence on you? Oh, geez. Um, almost too many. I'd say the one that I either think about or reference the most is uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, uh, kind of an oldie, but, uh, and a long one, I think it's like 800 pages. Oh my goodness. Um, but it just, it gave me such a great perspective on just kind of why the world is what it is. And, uh, I just thought it was absolutely fascinating. So, um, that, that's, that's my vote right there. Guns, germs, and steel. I'll add it into the show notes. Ask permission or beg for forgiveness. <sighs> you know, I've always been a beg for, for, uh, uh, forgiveness guy. Um, being at like the, in the DC level, uh, I'm, I'm leaning more towards ask for permission, and I'm hoping to stay away from that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to my guns and say, uh, you know, beg for forgiveness on this one. That's kind of a PAO PIO role right there. You know, just say yeah. it and hope you can get over it. If you could have coffee with any historical figure, who would you choose? Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big entertainment media guy, so I actually, for some reason, have always been obsessed with Charlie Chaplin and uh, read a few books on him, read his, read his autobiography, and I just, for some reason, I think I just, I'd probably gravitate towards just sitting down with him for an hour and just chit-chatting about, right. you know, his creativity. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've actually read, I think I've read one of his books, one of the books about him, and yeah, a very interesting person, extremely yeah. interesting person. What key points would you like that our listeners to take away from the interview today? Well, I hope that um, they, they have a better understanding of just what the Coast Guard is and does, um, just because we're, we're very complex, we're very small, but uh, a very passionate service. So um, one of the things that, that has really kept me in the service for 19 years is, is just the people I work with and, the, and their passion for 
both the ocean, the environment, and just for public safety as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a Coast Guard unit near you or you have a body of water near you, because that's another thing is that I talked to a bunch of people who live inland and they're like, why would I even worry about you know the Coast Guard? But any federal navigable waterway um, is is uh, pretty much owned under the authority of the Coast Guard. So it could be like in California when I was in D11, it was Lake Havasu, Lake Tahoe, Lake Mead um, in the the great the, the Great Land area. It's the, the entire inland river system. So Mississippi, Missouri, you name it. All all of that is is Coast Guard. So if you don't think that you're going to get to know your Coast Guard, you're probably wrong. So you should probably reach out and at least find out who your point of contact is. Um, and and you you'd be surprised. We're great people, and and as you can kind of see, we've kind of we've pretty much seen it all. So great resource to have. Uh, my Coast Guard Public Affairs Network, even from the the members who have retired and moved on, um, I I still keep text threads with a lot of them just to bounce ideas off of. So um, that's my I guess my my takeaway is uh, if you don't know whose district you're in for the Coast Guard for Public Affairs, uh, try to find out and try to reach out and just just make friends. Outstanding. I'll make sure I add that in the notes. As a reminder, reach out for your district uh, PAL. I like that. Anything you'd like to add? Um, you know, I, I just appreciate the opportunity to, um, you know, to, to speak with you here today. I think um, I, I've done quite a bit of, uh, like I say, a big history buff. And I've uh, one of my, a lot of the studies I did in grad school was really about the history of public relations and how it changed in the history of Coast Guard public affairs. Um, I think there's there really is a lot of parallels between Coast Guard public affairs and, and, and the public information, I guess, um, you know, discipline, if you will. Um, and, and it really hasn't been there. There's, there hasn't been that much academic research on public information. Everybody really has been focused for the last you know 100 years or so on public relations. And we're starting to see the differences of public information. So it's 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 great to see that we're starting to separate and kind of become our own discipline with resources such as you know the, the PIO toolkit the you know your podcast and you're starting to see a lot more academic you know research on a lot of the hur hurricane communications that that, yes. that we work out the the wildfires the pandemic all of that is is really public information um, and they're starting to see a difference between public information and public relations um, but also the similarity so if we can kind of bridge those two together and the more we talk about it the more we share with each other the more that's going to happen so just um, it's just it's great that that this is now turning into its own community. So, so thank you for welcoming me in, even though I'm not, you know, technically police, you know, we are law enforcement. So same family, you know, same roof. So absolutely. Uh, glad to be here. And, and like the, the podcast, not just only for police, we've always fire. We've had, mil I've had military PAOs here uh, from the army, from the Marines, the air force. So I've had many, they're not just police. Definitely not. I want to include everybody. Yeah. And, and I think that's great. That's great because that's, I think that's the thing is, is, uh, you know, if, if you, if you're dealing with some sort of emergency or some sort of crisis, I guarantee you someone else has already dealt with it and has already learned what, what, what you're about to learn. And so if the, the less time you can spend learning that lesson, um, you know, the, the better you're going to be as a PIO, the safer your public is going to be. And, and the more respect and credibility you're going to get from your, your commander. Um, and, uh, that is, that is, absolutely key as as a pao pio is having that relationship with your your you know your head table if you will i completely agree commander how can people best reach you if they want to connect or follow up on anything you've talked about today or uh, if they want to join the coast guard yeah well go coastguard.com um is is how you find a recruiter uh we just dropped a brand new logo uh this week uh for recruiting command so you'll see kind of a, a new photo for us and, and we're pushing a lot of that um, LinkedIn is the best way to get a hold of me. Um, I, I hate to think about it, but my, my years in the Coast Guard are probably numbered now that I'm at 19. I, I probably only have one or two jobs ahead of me, uh, to go. And then I, then I have to, uh, you know, hang up, hang up the microphone, I guess. Um, so LinkedIn is probably going to stay with me the best. And it's, I'm just, if you look up Matthew Kroll Coast Guard in LinkedIn, I'm, I'm hopefully probably the first or second person that comes up. I will add that into the show notes with a direct link for that as well. Great. Thank you. Commander Kroll, thank you very much for coming on the show and talking about the Coast Guard. I really appreciate it. It was a great opportunity, and you you really represent the organization very well. Well, thank you. Thank you. And the best to your son. You should be proud. I'm telling you, the, the, the front line of the Coast Guard impresses me every day, and that's the best part about being in public affairs is I get to see all these great success stories from 
around the country and, and around the, or across the country and around the globe. And so, um, you know, big thank you to your son and for you for supporting him uh, in, his, in his career here. Well, thank you, Commander. I appreciate it. And that was Commander Matthew Kroll from the U.S. Coast Guard. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. That's all for this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. On next week's episode of the PIO Podcast, we have Michaela Moskov. She's a Director of Public Information for Horry County Police Department. Another huge thank you to the Social Media Strategies Summit for being a sponsor of the PIO Podcast. Join their First Responders Summit this April or their Government Summit this May. Learn more about confirmed speakers and programming at socialmediastrategiessummit.com and use promo code PIO Podcast for 10% off of your registration. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get notified of the latest episode. If you are listening on a platform that allows reviews, please give us a review. We appreciate any review, good or bad. It helps us improve on each episode. Until next time, be safe.